Muslims in the beginning of the da'wah struggled a lot against culture. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent this religion actually to reform and mainly to change people traditions that has nothing to do with Sharia. And that was always the, uh, the challenge facing Muslims. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran about those who always like struggle against the pure message. وقالوا قالوا إن وجدنا آباءنا على أمة وإن على آثارهم مقتدون. This is how we found our forefathers doing, and we will always be following their footsteps. And Allah سبحانه وتعالى responded to them, What if your forefathers were wrong? So we will start إن شاء الله today talking about reform from Surah Al-Kaf. This is why Allah سبحانه وتعالى told Prophet Muhammad وسلم, to command us to read this surah every single week. Mainly because it reforms. It is the surah of reform. We said last week that mainly this surah reforms three on three axes. The first one is the axes, the axis of beliefs. And the second one is the axis of values. And the third one is the methodology of thinking or thinking methods. Today, inshallah, we are going to speak about how this surah reformed our beliefs or reforms continuously our beliefs. That's why the Prophet وسلم, commanded us to read it every single week. Next week, inshallah, if we were still alive, we will take the access of values and how this surah reforms our values. And then we will be talking to the end of the workshop about thinking methods and how this surah remo uh, uh, reforms the way uh, uh, Muslims think. Okay. We need to know that among the very first Surahs that descended on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is Surah Al-Muddathir. Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala told him, Ya ayyuha al-Muddathir, qum fa'anthir. Arise and give warning. Mainly to reform. And to give da'wah. And to change people. That was when this order came to the Prophet وسلم, 10 years before the order to pray. Before the command of prayers came with its details. 15 years before the command of doing zakah or saw. 18 years before the command of hajj. So the command to reform and to change came in the very beginning. So this is not a religion, this is a revolution. A revolution against people traditions and people cultures that has nothing to do with Islam. Let's see now how this surah reforms our aqidah. The beginning of the surah, in the very first few verses of this surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَيُنْذِرَ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا اتَّخَذَ اللَّهُ وَلَدًا That this surah or this Quran came to warn those people who assert that God has offspring, that God has a son. مَا لَهُمْ بِهِ مِنْ عِلْمٍ وَلَا لِآبَائِهِمْ كَبُرَتْ كَلِمَةً تَخْرُجُ مِنْ أَفْوَاهِهِمْ إِنْ يَقُولُونَ إِلَّا كَذِبًا They have no knowledge about this, nor did their forefathers. It is a monstrous assert, uh, assertion that comes out of their mouth. What they say is nothing but lies. You see here, you feel that, you feel the tone of anger. Allah is angry when he's saying this about people who 
asserted for him that he has a son, people who are telling lies about Allah, and the very last verse of the same surah, verse number 110, says, قُلْ إِنَّمَا أَنَا بَشَرٌ مِثْلُكُمْ يُوحَى إِلَيَّ أَنَّمَا إِلَاهُكُمْ إِلَاهُ وَاحِدٌ فَمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُو لِقَاءَ رَبِّهِ فَلْيَعْمَلْ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا وَلَا يُشْرِكْ بِعِبَادَةِ رَبِّهِ أَحْدًا Any verse in the Quran that starts with قُلْ قُلْ means say, it means say O Muhammad قُلْ يَا Muhammad Tell them, so any verse in the Quran that starts with قُلْ would say then it's a message from Allah to you sent through Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. What is this message? Say, I am just a human being like you. So the aqeedah of Muslims is that Prophet Muhammad is a human being like us. So if someone tells you that no, he's not like us. No, he's made from light. No, he's physically this, physically that, and he's lying and he's telling you something against the Quran. Prophet Muhammad is a man like us. Is he exactly like us? There's a difference, which is coming in the surah. You ha ilayya, but I receive revelation. We don't receive revelation, he receives revelation, but he's a human being like us. Who receives revelation? So this is number one. Because by time people tend to change and tend to make other people divine and people whom they love, they tend to make them gods or sons of gods or something like that. So this surah reforms and this surah rem reminds us that Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was a human being like us. The difference is he receives revelation. Yuha ilayya. What did he receive? Annama ilahukum ilahu wahid. The aqeedah of tawheed. He receives that the surah says, Say, I am just a human being like you who received revelation or who receives revelation that your God is one God. So this is aqeedah al tawheed. This is the main thing. And فَمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُوا لِقَاءَ رَبِّهِ The one who seeks salvation or the one who wants to go and meet Allah should فَمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُوا لِقَاءَ رَبِّهِ فَلْيَعْمَلْ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا وَلَا يُشْرِكْ بِعِبَادَةِ رَبِّهِ أَحَدًا Let him do good work and let him not associate anyone with Allah in the worship. The, did we explain this before? That the concept of salvation in Islam is a bird that flies with two wings. Did we explain this before to you? Okay, good. Here, the concept of salvation in Islam is al-iman wal-amal salih man yu'min wa ya'mal salihan those who believe and do good work, those who believe and do good work, you always find good work associated with belief in Islam. And of course, belief will always be mentioned first. Faith is always mentioned first and then good work, except in this ayah, in the whole Quran. Good work is mentioned before faith. Why? To draw the contrast with those who were criticized in the beginning of the surah. In the beginning of the surah, verse number four, number five is criticizing who? Mainly the Christians who ascribed for Allah that he has a son. Among the differences between Islam and Christianity is the concept of salvation. Christians believe that faith saves alone. They said, they tell you, if you believe in Jesus as Lord, you're saved. In Islam, if you say, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, you're not saved yet. You have to do good work. Those who believe and do good work.
we will come to this again but I'm just telling you when you read something you have to your, your mind should be like, be like you should remember what was mentioned in the same surah what was mentioned about aqidah so what, you can read the surah and then you read it with the eyes of those of the one who is reading only what's about aqidah and you start connecting them to each other to understand what Allah is telling you and then if you want to read it with the eye of looking at the values you read it all again and look at the values and how Allah sets your values and then you can read it looking at the thinking methods and this like that so now what we will do is we will we're like scanning the surah and everything that talks about aqidah we'll be talking about now the first thing that the prophet said in verse number 110 is yuha ilayya annama ilahukum ilahu wahid i receive revelation that your god is only one god this aqid tawheed He's speaking here about La ilaha illallah. One of the main mistakes of Muslims is that they don't understand the most important word that they have in their religion, which is La ilaha illallah. Many people take it in a very shallow way that it just means that there is no God except Allah. Therefore, all religions are wrong and we are the only good right religion, the only valid religion because we worship Allah. And that's it. That's all they think that what, what Tawheed means. But it means much more than this. Those who have pure Aqidah of Tawheed, they believe that there is no one to be worshipped except Allah according to this word. No one to be worshipped except Allah I will not worship anyone except Allah and I will not fear anyone except Allah. So those who fear others besides Allah, they are committing a type of shirk here, a type of polytheism in this point, the point of fear. You should not fear anyone except Allah. La ilaha illallah, I will not worship anyone except Allah, I will not fear anyone except Allah. I will not ask anyone except Allah. I will not complain to anyone except to Allah. You see, you, you, the father of Joseph, of Yusuf, Ya'qub, in Surah Yusuf, he's saying, إِنَّمَا أَشْكُوا بَثِّي وَحُزْنِي لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ I complain my, my sadness to Allah. Complain to Allah. Don't complain to people. If you complain to people, it's like, you're complaining from Allah to people. Complain to Allah. Ask Allah only. I worship no one except Allah. I ask no one except Allah. I fear no one except Allah. I hope from no one except Allah because no one can give me except Allah. I love no one except Allah and what Allah loves. I hate nothing except what Allah hates. And like that, you will be directed with all your feelings towards Allah. All the feelings. All the feelings. The feelings, uh, positive feelings and negative feelings. All the feelings that you have should be directed towards Allah. You love what Allah loves and you love Allah, of course. Even you hate what Allah hates, like kufr, like shirk, like zulm, like oppression, like all these things that Allah hates, we should hate. Oppression, evil. Some people may come here and say, no, a Muslim should not hate anything. Of course, a Muslim should hate evil. So even the negative feelings can be directed in the right direction. When you do that, when you believe when, when la ilaha illallah becomes the core of your faith, it breaks your chains. It brings real freedom to you. Because if you do believe that there is no God except Allah, and you worship no one except Him, you fear no one except Him, you ask no one except Him, you hope from no one except Him, in this case, you will never 
become a slave anymore to any other, to any person, and to any material, to any desire, to no one. Yeah, can, can you stay away from the cable? So this shahada actually breaks the chains. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described Prophet Muhammad sallallahu with a lot of names and, and in, in, with many attributes in the Quran. We focused on all of them except one. It was not taught to us. Prophet Muhammad among his attributes is that he is al-muharrir, the liberator. The liberator, but because we were always ruled in the Muslim world with oppressors, so they did not teach us that he came with liberation, that he came with freedom, and they did not tell us that he is a liberator. Where is this in the Quran? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes him in the Quran saying, That Allah sent him to break their chains break our chains, to break the colors. So he is a liberator. The one who believes that la ilaha illallah, he liberates himself. He unleashes his spirit. This is first. Second, we need to talk about the concept of salvation with details. The concept of salvation in Islam is a bird that flies with two wings. With one wing it will fall down. It can't fly. The first wing is faith and the second wing is good work, good deeds. Al-Iman wal amal al-Salih. And as I said, Allah always mentions them associated with each, with each other. Al-Ladina amanu wa amilu al-Salihat. Man yu'man wa amal salihan. Those who believe in the good work, those who believe in the good work, all the way, all the time in the Quran, they are associated with each other. So if someone says, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, that's not enough for him to go to Jannah, except maybe if he dies directly without having the chance to do good work. But he has to do good work. Mainly <clears throat> in Protestantism, Among the main difference, differences between Islam and, and, and evangelism is that they believe that if you believe in Jesus as Lord, you're saved. So for them, faith saves. Just faith saves. For us, no. We have to do good work. Which one is more comfortable? Of course, the Christian belief is more comfortable. Of course, you just believe and stay like that until you die. That's it. Definitely, it's more comfortable. But it's not right, it's not true. So I can comfort you with something that's not true. Telling you just wrong news, which is not true. And add to this, because I like always to do like comparative, I mean, compare with other religions sometimes. Add to this that, if you take their shahada or their whatever, the believe in Jesus as Lord, okay, how can I be saved? Just stay like that until you die. Can I do anything else? No, just stay like that. I'm not saying that Christians don't do good work. Christians do a lot of good work. A lot of good work. But they do it because Jesus loves them. But I was once in a panel in Washington, D.C with a, uh, a very famous evangelical uh, speaker. And he said, if you believe that any good work that you do in this life will help you on judgment day, this is a sin in itself. For us, no, it will help. You need it. You need to do good work. Comparing this, when someone comes to me and tells me, believe in Jesus as your Lord to be saved. And I say, God forbid, okay, what if I do so now? What happens? Just stay like that until you die. And don't need to do anything else. No, don't do anything else. So it's very static. 
very static, very barren concept. It's not fruitful. But if someone tells me, take shahada, say, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Okay, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Am I saved? No, not yet. But what can I do? Do good work. Like what? Smile in the face of your fellow Muslim. Because the Prophet ﷺ said, when you smile in the face of your fellow Muslim, this is like spending in charity. Okay, good. I'm smiling in your faces. Is this enough? No. Why? Because we cannot make sure if Allah accepted it or not. Why not? Because maybe your intentions was not pure. So what can I do? Do more good work. Like what? Carry heavy things with someone who's like struggling to carry his bags or from the supermarket or something. Okay, I'll go and I carry things and help people. Is this enough? No, not enough. Why? Maybe Allah didn't accept it. Maybe you didn't have pure intentions. What do I do? Do more good work. So you keep doing good work all the time. After every time you do good work, you should be between two feelings. The feeling of al khawf wa raja. You should fear that maybe it wasn't accepted. And you should hope that Allah with his awesome mercy accepts it. Because you should always think good about Allah. So this is a fruitful concept. This is a barren concept. This is a dynamic concept. This is a static concept. Thank you very much. Who sent it for, with you? Who sent it? Thank you. So this is one of the main things that we need to understand. So here the surah comes to reform our aqidah in terms of who is our God? How can we deal with him? Because loving Allah is a way of dealing, but you deal with your heart. To love someone is you are dealing with him, but with your heart. And regarding how can you go to Jannah? How can you be in heavens? It's by doing good work and having faith. And as I said, this is the only time when doing good work was mentioned before faith. In verse number 110, he said, let him do good work and not associate anyone with Allah. Because it's like drawing the contrast to the, uh, like the Christian theology. Also, we said last time that we have four main stories in this surah. The first story is the story of the people who slept in the cave, the youth who slept in the cave. this story there is a lot of reform for aqidah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in verse number 14 speaks about the youth saying وَرَبَطْنَا عَلَىٰ قُلُوبِهِمْ إِذْ قَامُوا فَقَالُوا رَبُّنَا رَبُّ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ لَنْ نَدْعُوَ مِنْ دُونِهِ إِلَاهَا لَقَدْ قُلْنَا إِذَا شَطَطَا we gave strength to their hearts when they stood up and said our Lord is the Lord of the heavens and earth we shall never call upon any God other than him, for that would be an outrageous thing to do. Here we see that these youth were a vulnerable minority. Muslims in this place, in this country, were a vulnerable minority and they were oppressed. But still, they did not compromise their religion. They had this slogan, Dinuka, Dinuka, Lahmuka, Damuk. Your religion is your flesh and your blood. They did not compromise their religion, even though they are a minority. And they said, We shall not, we shall never call upon any God other than Him. <coughs> Some people may wonder. Why here the word God is, does, is not capitalized? The, the G is not capitalized. Does anyone know? Yes. Exactly, because this one refers to false gods. Always when you read, 
and you see the word God in small g, it means that the one who wrote doesn't believe in that as God. So when you say uh, 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 Roman gods, Greek gods, African gods, you as Muslim should write it in small g. Because the other way, yani anyone reading this should understand that you as an author or as a writer, you don't believe in this God. You don't share it with them. Okay. Good. So this gives us the example also. Those are vulnerable, small Muslim minority, and still they did not compromise their religion and what? And when they made da'wah, they made it strongly. Allah here says, we gave strength to their hearts when they stood up and said, our Lord is the Lord of the heavens and the earth. He didn't say, Qalu Rabbuna Rabbu earth. They said, our Lord is the Lord of the heavens. He said, we give, we gave strength to their hearts and they stood up and said, which means they did all their effort to give da'wah and to declare their faith. In the commentary on the story, I said last time that we have 71 verses that are telling us those four stories and 39 verses that are mainly commentary. The Quran is making comments on the stories and scenes from the hereafter. In the comments that the Quran is doing on the story, in verse number 26, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قُلِ اللَّهُ أَعْلَمُ بِمَا لَبِثُوا لَهُ غَيْبُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ أَبْصِرْ بِهِ وَأَسْمِعْ مَا لَهُمْ مِنْ دُونِهِ مِنْ وَلَيٍّ وَلَا يُشْرِكُ فِي حُكْمِهِ أَحَدًا Say, God knows best how long they stayed. His is the knowledge of all that is hidden in the heavens and earth. How well he sees how well he hears, which means he can see everything, he can hear everything, and they have no one to protect them other than him. He does not allow anyone to share his rule. Two things here that we need to understand in Aqidah, which is actually in, in, in yellow. They have no one to protect them other than him. No protector except Allah. No one can protect you except Allah. No one can protect your children except Allah. No one can protect your money and your wealth except Allah. No one can you protect, your, protect your health except Allah. No one can protect your country except Allah. Anything that you fear that it, it perishes or it's destroyed or it gets weak or, or it gets less, only Allah can protect it. No protector except Allah. This is also among the aqidah of Tawheed. And he doesn't share his, his uh, decisions with anyone. He doesn't consult with anyone. Allah told us to consult, but Allah is not going to consult. Here this brings us to the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, that he was, that he used to teach uh, Ibn Abbas. I don't know if it's Fadl ibn Abbas or maybe uh, just Abdullah ibn Abbas. Maybe this is a mistake. Abdullah, right? Not al Fadl. Yeah, that's a mistake. He told him when he was young, Oh, young man, I shall teach you some words of advice. Be mindful of Allah and Allah will protect you. Keep Allah in mind and Allah will protect you. Be mindful of Allah and you will find him close to you. You will find him in front of you. You will find him very close to you. Even though you cannot see Allah, but he will be very close to you if you keep him in mind. If you ask, then ask Allah alone. If you seek help, then seek help from Allah alone. And let know that if the nation, the ummah, the whole ummah, if the nation, if the whole nation 
were together together to benefit you with anything they would not benefit you except with what Allah had already prescribed for you so no one can benefit you except with what Allah prescribed for you and if they were together together to harm you with anything they would not harm you except with what Allah had already prescribed against you and if anyone wants to harm you he cannot except with what Allah have written that it had to happen it, it will happen to you <coughs> the pens have been lifted and the pages have dried which means full stop period so this is a lesson that the Prophet ﷺ is giving to a young boy it's a lesson in Tawheed he's not telling him to memorize the whole Juz number 30 He's telling him to keep Allah in mind in order to be protected. He's telling him to keep Allah in mind in order to feel Allah close to him. He's telling him not to ask anyone except Allah. And he's telling him that no one and not to seek help from anyone except Allah. And he's telling him that no one can harm him except with what Allah have written for him. And no one can give him except what Allah have given him, have written for him to have. Of course, the Prophet ﷺ told us, the one who doesn't thank people, doesn't thank Allah. So when someone gives you, thank him and let know in mind that he didn't really give you. It's Allah who gave you. But still, you have to thank people. No one can do anything for you, give you or deprive you. It's Allah who's giving and depriving. The part of the verse that says that Allah doesn't share anyone in his rulings Allah does not allow anyone to share his rule here this brings us to Surah Al-Anbiya verse number 23 where Allah says لا يسألوا عما يفعلوا وهم يسألون he cannot be called to account for anything he does whereas they will be called to account because the problem today is that yeah do we have questions about Islam sure you can have questions about Islam you can ask your question and any answer that anyone gives you you should know that it's not the answer when you ask me questions and i answer them it's not the answer it is my attempt to answer when can we know if it's right or wrong on the day of judgment that's it this is the beauty of this religion by the way we always have to learn and we need to understand that this knowledge will not, we cannot reach all the knowledge. Not even very little. And this is very clear in the ver very, very last verses uh, of the Quran when Allah says that if the whole ocean was ink to write the words of Allah, and the words of Allah means the knowledge of Allah. It will not write it even if we bring a whole ocean like it of ink. Still, it will not write the words of Allah. This is the beauty of the religion. It tells you you have to seek knowledge. And it tells you also you will never find it all. But try to seek knowledge. Just learning in itself makes you knowledgeable. By learning. Keep learning. But the issue is, what if you don't find answers that convince you this is very it happens a lot and you have to accept what Allah tells you even you may not be able to understand the wisdom from everything this can be a test for your obedience when Allah told Adam don't eat from that tree eat from every tree in Jannah except that one Allah did not tell him why just don't eat from it. Why? Testing his obedience. Why Allah made pork haram? Some people stop uh, saying, because it eats garbage. What if it doesn't eat garbage? What if we grow it well and we feed it good, healthy uh, plants? Will it be halal? Still haram. Why then is it haram? Because Allah said so. Allah is testing the obedience. 
Allah did not tell Adam not to eat from the tree because it's watered by garbage. It's because it's haram. Everything is halal except that tree. Also in dunya, everything is halal except the haram, which is very little, but mainly to test your obedience, to test your, the level of faith that you have. So it is okay to wander and try to find the wisdom. And if you don't find the wisdom, you still have to obey Allah and show Allah from you that you have strong faith and you will be obeying even if you don't understand the wisdom. The second story is called, many people call it Sahibul Jannatayn, the owner of the two gardens. While actually, I would rather call it a Sahibain, the two friends. Because it talks about two people, when he told his companion or his friends, and we always focus on the kafir and we never focus on the Muslim among them. But this is something that we will talk about in the methodology of thinking. So I will leave it alone now. And I will now focus on the aqidah issues in this story. Verse number 37 and 38 says, Qala his companion retorted, I told you to read this surah during the week, right? Who read it? Okay. You have to read it again this coming week, okay? We'll understand it. His companion retorted, Have you no faith in him who created you from dust? from a small drop of fluid then shaped you into a man. But for me, he is God, my Lord, and I will never set up any partner with him. This is the Muslim companion talking to the Kafir, uh, to, to his companion, the Kafir. How is he a Kafir? Why is he a Kafir? He's a Kafir, why? why is it, does he believe that there is no God? Is he an atheist? He's not. The problem is, he is so arrogant because of his wealth. And he, he takes this wealth for granted. In verse number 35, which is the verse before, and 36, he said, it says, وَدَخَلَ جَنَّتَهُ وَهُوَ ظَالِمٌ لِنَفْسِهِ قَالَ مَا أَظُنُّ أَن تَبِيدَ هَذِهِ أَبَدًا وَمَا أَظُنُّ السَّاعَةَ قَائِمَةً وَلَئِنْ رُدِدْتُ إِلَىٰ رَبِّي he went into his garden and wronged himself by saying, I do not think this will ever perish. He doesn't like feel that there's a God who can make his wealth perish. This is kufr. This is shirk. He's not worshipping anyone with Allah, by the way. But he's worshipping his money. Or that the last hour will ever come. He doesn't believe that there is a day of judgment. This makes him a kafir too. Even if I were to be taken back to my Lord, so even if there's a day of judgment and I'll be taken back to my Lord, I would certainly find something even better there. I am a rich person. In Egypt we say, Arab Nines. I am from a good family, so I'll be always in good shape. Even if there is a day of judgment, I will be even wealthier, the more wealthy. So it is expected that his fellow, that the, 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 his, his, his compa the Muslim companion, when he talks and he reminds him with what? That Allah is the sustainer. Allah is the one who gives. Allah is the provider. But no, he didn't say so. He said, Have you no faith in him who created you? Not who provided for you. But I, I was expecting that he tells him, have you no faith in the one who provides for you, who gives you? Razaqak. But no, he said, Billadi khalaqak. Why? Because this is the first term in your relationship with Allah. In our relationship with Allah, there are certain terms. The first one and the most important one is Allah is the creator. 
الله هو الخالق الله is the creator he's reminding him that he's the one who brought him to existence actually creating us in itself is a ni'ma is a gift from Allah so the ni'ma the ni'am the gifts of Allah are of two types ni'mat al-ijad and then ni'am al-imdad the ni'ma the gift of ijad ijad means existing Allah brought you to existence and this in itself is ni'ma and then providing for you this is the other gifts but some people here may say no just existing is not ni'ma I really want it not to exist many of us sometimes think like that why did Allah didn't why didn't Allah ask me before creating me many youth come with to me with this question why didn't Allah ask me before creating me how did he want to how do you want him to ask you if you didn't exist if you didn't exist and you want him to ask you before you exist but you don't exist how do you want him to ask you second Allah can do everything I will assume that somehow he got to you and he asked you before your existence do you think that you will say no I don't want to exist perishing being nothing nothingness is scary atheists who don't believe in God who don't believe that there is life after death who don't believe in Jannah or hellfire do what look right and left before they cross the street why because they don't want to die why don't they want to die they don't believe in Jahannam because nothing they, they are afraid to become nothing nothingness is scary so they want to exist existence in itself is enough but the problem is when you exist and you don't know why do you exist and you say I'm not enjoying yeah I know that I exist but I'm not happy I'm not enjoying who told you that you have to enjoy who told you that Allah brought you to this life to enjoy had Allah brought you to this life and made your goal to enjoy he could have uh, created us in a theme park yeah you go to university with a roller coaster every day and you take the slide going back home and but it's not like that you are here in a test here in this life Allah said in Surah Al-Mulk he created death and life to test you who among you will do good every test has an exit point and an entry point they tell you the English language test starts at 8 ends at 10 Allah says here in this verse he created death which is the exit point and life which is the entry point to test you and he mentioned the exit point first because it's the funny one it's the one that we don't want to know when will it happen but the entry point we all know when you were born you entered into life and when you reach puberty your the records are open and everything is now recorded but the death when will it happen how can we know who's the first one to die in this room do we collect the date of birth and find the oldest the, the eldest of us no maybe the youngest no one knows no one knows so here he's reminding him that he is the one who made him exist he's the one who created him Allah emphasized on this point so much in the Quran Allah mentioned the word khalaqa with its derivatives khalaqa khalaqatu khalaqna over 200 times and he mentioned the word ja'ala make in a way that serves creation the meaning of creation over 300 times 
We made from water every living thing. We made every living thing from, we made, we created. And so many other terms like البدء, start. He started the creation and he will do it again. So start also serves the meaning of creation. And so many other terms are mentioned in the Quran to serve the meaning of creation. Like at taswir imaging, giving images. He gives you your image in your mother's wombs as he wishes. Al-Fatr, al Innovator, innovation. The word innovation is mentioned to serve the meaning of creation. And so many other words. Why? Because this is the first term in your relationship, in your contract with Allah. He is your creator. You should be very thankful for that. And here, when I see the Muslim companion telling the non-Muslim, The other man, his sin is that he was so proud of his wealth. Here we see the Muslim also very proud of his Lord. Saying, but for me, he is God, my Lord, and I will never set up any partner with him. In a in a, in a tone of pride, but he's proud of being mu'min. Not of being rich, not of being white, not of being Arab, not of being Bengali. No, all these things has no value. Being Bengali is not enough. Doesn't help you. Being Arab doesn't help you. Being rich doesn't help you. Because many of us are just proud of things that mean nothing. Being a believer, being a Muslim, helps. Being a believer is what you should be very proud of. Proud that this is your Lord. And we said before, the biggest gift in this world is Islam. That Allah guided you to Islam or made you born as Muslim. It's the biggest gift. Biggest gift. Why? And I know that if I'm talking to Christians, they will say the biggest gift is Christianity. Jews will say Judaism. And everyone is just singing his song. No, the biggest gift is Islam. I think I explained this before, but I'll explain it again for you. Number one, Allah created in this world different types of creatures. Allah created non-living things like water, like soil. Allah then created a higher rank creature than non-living objects, like plants. And then Allah created a higher rank creature than plants, animals. And then Allah created a higher rank creature than animals, human beings. And Allah have made the system in this world like that. Every creature is in the service of the higher rank creatures, not the opposite. So water and soil serve plants. Plants don't serve water and soil. Water and soil serve plants. And they serve us. And they serve animals. Plants serve animals. Animals eat plants, right? And serve us, we also eat salad, right? Animals serve us. Because we eat the animals, we ride the animals, we drink the milk of the animals, we wear the leather of the animals, and we are the servants of Allah. Only if we are Muslim. Only if we're Muslim, then we are on the top of the pyramid of creation. Allah made everything serving us, and we are the servants of Allah. We worship Allah. If I were to worship another human being, God forbids, then I have to go one rank down to worship a human being. One rank below the rank of human beings. If I were to worship an animal, I have to go two ranks down, even below an animal, to worship an animal. Can you imagine? Don't smile. 
it's not. Don't be surprised. One billion people in this world worship animals. And billions worship human beings. No human being can be worshipped. Buddha was a great man. Uh, Jesus was one of the most beautiful five people who ever walked the face of the earth. Why can't we worship him? For a very simple reason. He is not worthy of worship. Neither him nor Prophet Muhammad. None is worthy of worship except Allah. This is your aqidah. This is what the surah is doing for you. This is how it's reforming you. And you should be very proud of being Muslim, not of being rich, not of being beautiful, not of being Arab, not of being anything. You're Muslim. You're connected to him. In the commentary on the story of the owner of the two gardens, or how they call it, هناك الولاية لله الحق هو خير ثوابا وخير عقبا. The only protection is that of God, the true God. He gives the best rewards and the best outcome. Here it is commenting on the story of the man who lost his garden and it perished, his wealth perished as a punishment for him. Speaking about the protection, protection for his wealth. So Allah protects you, protects your wealth, protects your children, protects your health. It's Allah who protects. So always keep that in mind. Also, among the scenes of the hereafter, it's verse number 52. وَيَوْمَ يَقُولُ نَادُوا شُرَكَائِيَ الَّذِينَ زَعَمْتُمْ فَدَعَوْهُمْ فَلَمْ يَسْتَجِيبُوا لَهُمْ وَجَعَلْنَا بَيْنَهُمْ مَوْبِقًا On the day of judgment, God will say, Call on those you claimed were my partners. They will call them, but they will not answer. We shall set a deadly gulf between them. Actually, this is so fair. Allah on the day of judgment will not take the unbelievers and send them to hellfire like that. No, he will give them a chance. Tell them, call on your deities. Let them take you to heaven. So Christians will be calling Jesus. Buddhists will be calling Buddha. The Hindus will be calling Krishna. Everyone who called, who worshipped a god will call him. Come help me. And then what will happen? Are they going to respond to them? They're not going to respond to them. Actually, وَجَعَلْنَا بَيْنَهُمْ مَوْبِقَ And we, we set a deadly gulf between them. They will even respond and telling them, Who told you to worship us? Why did you assume that we can help you? We can't help ourselves. So Allah is so fair. Because some people here may come and say, But still, uh, many uh, non-Muslims do a lot of good things and do a lot of good work. Why can't they go to heaven? Why Allah is not going to take them to paradise? Okay, they did not worship Allah, they worship someone else. Let them help them. Yeah, someone is working for Microsoft. How come he goes to Oracle and tell them to pay him? Go to Microsoft to pay you. This is simple, it's logical, very logical. So the Quran, even in Aqidah, is very logical. Saying that Allah will tell them, go call upon my partners that you associated with me. And here, it feels like Allah is also angry of what they did, saying, Did they think that they could take my servants as masters instead of me? Those are his servants. Jesus is a servant of God. Buddha is a servant of God. Krishna is a servant of God. We have prepared hell as the disbelievers' resting place. The issue is, as Muslims, are, do, I have any, do we have anything to do with these verses? Of course. How come? I don't worship Jesus. I don't worship uh, Buddha. I don't worship Krishna. But some of us worship money. Some of us worship power. We have our 21st century gods that some of us are falling into polytheism by worshiping them. Only worship Allah. Again, La ilaha illallah. 
There is no one to worship except Allah, no one to fear except Allah, no one to ask except Allah, no one to love except Allah and what He loves, and no one to dislike except what He dislikes. Make Him the core of your faith, and this in itself will break your chains. I have to stop here. Actually, we, alhamdulillah, finished the axis of Aqidah. We have five minutes for questions. So, if anyone wants to ask any question, next time, inshallah, we will talk about Mizan al Qiyam, the values, the set of values, and how this surah shapes your set of values. Any question? Ladies first. Any question from the ladies' side? Okay, since ladies first, we will start with the men. Any question from the men's side? Uh, how long will this course be? This course is eight weeks. We, today is the second. The first one was only for women. After that, it's mixed. Yeah. Okay, any question from the sister side? Yes, sister. And what? No. Excellent. How can you complain to Allah without being ungrateful? Look at what Prophet Muhammad said to Allah after he was stoned and chased by the uh, uh, kids in a Ta'if. You know what happened to him? He went to give da'wah, they sent their kids, stoning him, calling him bad names, calling him crazy, idiot, stuff like that, and stoning him. It's very humiliating. He sat down and he complained to Allah. Read what he said. And see how he's so grateful at the same time complaining to Allah, not to anyone else. Huh? So this is a good example, actually. Can anyone remind me with what he said? Allahumma inni ashku ilayka da'fa quwati. Oh Allah. I complain to you, ba'fa quwwati, my weakness. Quwwati, wa hawani ala nas, and the way people look at me, degrading me and downgrading me. Mom said what? Okay, Habibi. Okay, okay. So look at the uh, the, 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 this uh, example of the Prophet ﷺ, complaining to Allah from his weakness and from the way people treat him and then he tells Allah if this is not a punishment from you because you are angry of me I don't care but he wants Allah to know that he is not willing to have more hardship of course. So he said, But welfare is better for me, and you have welfare. So he is complaining to Allah very politely, very politely. This is a good example to take, but the, I don't have in mind now the exact words of the Prophet. Salam, brother. Can you please tell us, can we read Quran when the sun is rising? Yes, of course, you can read Quran. Actually, when the sun is, uh, the, the question says, can we read Quran when the sun is rising? Actually, definitely yes. Because actually, when the sun is rising and the sun is exactly setting, this is the time when we don't pray, but we do adhkar. The dhikr, the first type of dhikr is Quran, and then salah, and then adhkar. So you can read Quran all the time, of course. Okay? And also, one of the things is, Many sisters think that during their monthly menses, which lasts for about a week, they don't read Quran at all. They don't do adhkar at all. How come? You're unplugging yourself for a whole week. You just don't touch the Quran, the, the Arabic uh, Quran. That's it. You, that's all you do. You don't touch it. But you can read from an iPad, from an, uh, from an iPhone, from your computer, from a book of tafsir. You can read the English one and, and, and hand it, yani, yani, carry it normally because it's not the Quran. Even if it has Arabic in it, still no problem. Okay? As long as not the Arabic Quran alone. Okay? So don't, yani, you should not unplug yourself. The one who doesn't read Quran for more than 24 hours is like a dead mobile battery. 
This heart is like a mobile battery. It needs charge. It needs to be charged with the Quran. The Quran is your charger. And this should happen for about an hour every day. Next question. Okay. Sure. Of course he was, oh no, of course. No, no, no. Moses before receiving revelation was not a prophet but was a believer. You have to understand that the sons of Israel are the Muslim Ummah for 2500 years. So when we talk about the Israelites, or the Quran, what the Quran tells us about the sons of Israel, is telling us about the Muslim Ummah at that time. And most of the prophets were among them. Many prophets were among them. So actually those are Muslim prophets and that was a Muslim ummah, but it committed a lot of mistakes and a lot of sins. And when Allah tells us about them, he's telling us about them to take the lesson from them. But it's a Muslim ummah. But he was, a, he was, he was an Israelite, he was still a, he was still a Muslim. Okay. okay. Jazakumullah khairan, barakallahu feekum. And next week, inshallah, uh, we have to come on time and uh, for the men I apologize that maybe the announcement was so late uh, but uh, we will inshallah announce it for men also next time. Jazakumullah khairan and barakallahu